Good evening. The Bothell Planning Commission meeting for Wednesday, October 8th will come to order. Are there any non-agenda public comments? Uh, hearing none, let the record show that um, all commissioners are present and accounted for except for Commissioner Patrick Cabe, who's absent and excused. Uh, this evening we have no minutes to approve. Um, we have one item of new business. I wanted to formally introduce uh, David Vliet, our new newest commissioner. David, welcome to uh, joining us. Thank you, Steve. And uh, we'll look forward to your uh, your thoughts and your uh, your uh, counsel in working with us. Thank you. Um, we move forward in our um, agenda to a public hearing. And actually, it's a reopening of the public hearing of, on the 2015 periodic plan and code update. We have two e e uh, agenda items this evening. Uh, first, the proposed code amendment regarding accessory dwelling units. And then we will hear on a third review of the uh, transportation element. And so at uh, this point, I'm going to turn the agenda over to David Boyd um, and also Art Sullivan. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, I'm just going to open things up, and, and Art's, Arthur's going to uh, lead the, uh, the bulk of the discussion on the accessory dwelling units. Uh, this is our uh, third review of this. There was an introductory review, uh, and then on uh, uh, September 17th, we uh, had a more thorough uh, and detailed review, uh, at which time we got uh, uh, direction from the commission to bring back uh, code language. So um, what we thought we would do tonight, uh, we, you do have the proposed code language in your packet, uh, and uh, so we can go uh, back and, and go through the outline as a as a way of uh, reviewing those issues. See where, make sure that we've gotten uh, your direction uh, correctly, and also to uh, um, to finish going through the outline. We didn't quite get all the way through it last time, uh, uh, if you like, uh, and then uh, move into the proposed code language. Uh, uh, if you'd like to jump straight to the code language, we we could also do do that. Um, and then uh, we have we didn't put this in the packet, but uh, I, I, we have draft drafted a potential finding. Uh, there aren't going to be separate findings for each of these code issues that are part of the the overall plan and code update. There'll be a, a kind of an omnibus uh, a set of uh, findings, but we thought it'd be appropriate to at least review language for that at this point uh, that would be added to those uh, overall. I think okay. I'm fine with that agenda and, okay. and overall. Um, I want us to stay focused not just on reviewing this, but on what are the specific things this evening that we need to make decisions on, that you need guidance from us. Right. So um, I did notice in the memo that you had um, three issues remaining to be resolved That's right correct. there. So, so let's make sure we focus on those. Yeah. And then as we, if we do that review, both of the outline as well as the potential code amendments, that we do it in a timely manner. Yeah. Uh, so those three issues are, are um, uh, whether to allow rental of an owner-occupied uh, unit for less than uh, six months a year uh, in the case of a, a snowbird uh, uh, that wants to um, rent, uh, rent their unit while they're uh, out of gone for part of the year, less than half the year. Uh, specific size limits for attached and detached units, the, the proposal has two options for you to consider, and whether there's a need for a director's exception for uh, the size of single floor detached uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, that we'll get into in more detail. And here's the the potential finding that, uh, that I drafted for this, uh, a single finding uh, on ADUs that simply states that the Planning Commission finds that it is appropriate to modify regulations for accessory, accessory dwelling units to provide affordable housing options for Bothell residents while protecting the integrity of single-family housing areas. Um, and we can come back to that uh, if you wish. So uh, the steps uh, are to review the outline, uh, um, do a page-by-page -page review of the code language, uh, and um, uh, to provide direction to staff for any changes, and if you're ready to go ahead and make a recommendation tonight, 
uh, or if not, uh, to continue deliberations to November 19th is when, when uh, the schedule allows us to bring it back. So with that, I'm going to, yeah. We, d we do have the images from last time available if, if, uh, if you do want to uh, So, uh, Dave, my only guidance would be that um, I'm fine with those as next steps for us. Let's try to limit this seg segment to at least to no more than 45, 50 minutes. We're at 7.05 now, so let's try to be wrapping up by, let's say, 10, 10 to 8. Um, so if we have proceeded in a quickly quick manner um, and we can go ahead and do that code language review, let's by all means do it. Okay, so ready to jump right into it? Sure. So what I'm going to suggest is what we tried to do is make it so that even though we have the outline, we've added into after each section what is the specific proposed language to be put into the code. So I would focus on the outline, and you can, if you want, refer and see how it then jumps into the code. But so I'd say if you go to attachment one, go to the first page, um, and as was noted, we had two. We provided you two choices. For how, and this is something you were talking about at the last meeting, and that was how did you want to deal with owner occupancy for allowing some flexibility for the homeowner to, we did agree that they could be in either of the two units. The question was, was there some preference related to duration and the potential to rent? So on the middle of page um, one there, you see two options. One is the owner must occupy one of the dwelling units on the property for more than six months of each calendar year. Be silent on the rental issue. And then the other is the owner must occupy one or the dwelling units for more than six months of each calendar year and may not receive rent for the owner-occupied dwelling unit at any time during the year. So those are the two things we're bringing back. You obviously can take either of those or do some further modification. So I would turn it over to, um, to uh, ourselves here at this point. So either of those two uh, languages and any comments on them? Commissioner Clark. I actually have a question first. So the, the first of the two options would, it, because it's silent on rental, would allow a rental of, of the, the either unit on, for six months, I guess. If the owner has to occupy it for six months, they could theoretically rent the other for the mm -hmm. other six months? Is that? I, I think there would be no provision to preclude that, okay. correct? Okay. I had one question. So on the second provision, this idea of may not receive rent for the owner pocket, how are we really going to enforce that or how would we really know whether they are or are not receiving rent? So what happens in situations is, as with many code issues, is you're going to kind of rely on a complaint probably mm -hmm. and then use code enforcement procedures. <clears throat> All right. But you at least have the ability if somebody does raise it, you'd have a basis for looking at it. Any other questions, comments? I guess I'd like to just say that I'm I'm in favor of the the second of the two. Um, I think it falls in line with the affordable housing uh, um, that if they can rent it for six months of the year, that may be an a opportunity for somebody that is um, temporary temporarily needs housing or a student or something like that to rent that. And I think that's a a reasonable way to look at it. Commissioner Gastineau. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Eric. So wouldn't you wouldn't you want one then that, that will allow them to? I, use? I'm sorry. Yes, I, I would want one. Yeah, I yeah okay. apologize for that. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of an. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I'm in agreement with you on that. So that's why I was going. I was hoping he was hmm. going to one. Yeah. I, think, yeah, I think I'm wearing my glasses upside down or something. <clears throat> Any other comments? Or I think we're kind of ready to kind of weigh in on this. All right. Let me just look, just amongst ourselves. So um, all in favor of uh, the first language, uh, say aye. 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 I think that was unanimous. Or all in favor of the second. Okay. okay. I think uh, we're going to go with the first statement. Okay. Um, related to that, what we were suggesting is some of that was addressed in the definition section, and because it only applied to the definition, this only applies to ADUs, we thought it was better to put it in the ADU section, and so we're proposing moving it from the definition section to the ADU uh, code section. So there's no other, the language is the same, we're just suggesting it be moved. Okay? Any issues with that? None. That's fine. Okay. Um, on limitation on occupancy, um, we are proposing that the language be added to 4B um, related to um, occupancy, which you see at the bottom of the page, um, of page one. 
and that is the total number of occupants in both primary residence and accessory may not exceed the maximum number established by the definition of family in section and then we filled in that in the code section. So I think this is something you were in concurrence last time and so we've made that change to the draft code. Any uh, comments on that? I, I, I wasn't hearing so just and maybe I'm, I'm not reading this but in the um, page two under code language, it talks about a minimum of 300 and a maximum of 800. And then I go to the next box underneath it, and it says 220 square feet and a maximum of 900 square feet. How well, not that quite. I was actually dealing with a slightly different issue. That's the next issue. Okay. This is just about um, household size. Okay. Uh, and then I, I had a question about uh, the, the actual number from the current code. Uh, eight unrelated persons uh, was uh, that something that that we have discussed before? I know, I've, I, I've been in a homeowners association where that issue has come up. That eight seemed like a very high number. Uh, there were a lot of complaints about the the amount of traffic that that would generate and the the the, the parking situation that that would generate eight. because the the area wasn't really intended for that high of a density of. You know, usually when they're unrelated people, they, they each have their own car. They they bring more traffic. They bring it's like eight eight houses all in one. Um, so was there was there is that something that's open for discussion or is that that, that seems our like a broader change? issue than ADUs? Yeah, we're, we're, that is right. we're really and I had a number of comments on current Bothell Code definition of a family and it's eight and cooking and living together et, et cetera. But I don't think that's really uh, in kind of what we're discussing this evening. So I, I'm not saying your issue is not important one that could sh could and should be debated, but I don't think that's what we're going to debate ask, this evening. Can I ask a question, Mike? Is is this a perceived or is it, are you actually seeing this? I, we have, because we, this is going to come up again. I don't know if we want to spend, but we've had a uh, um, one of our residents come and talking about this, and we're going to talk about this on a different issue, but I'm just asking you, Mike, is this something that is actually happening in subdivisions you know of? Uh, well, yeah. Or is it um, that it could happen? Yeah, so I, I used to be on my homeowner's board, and what's interesting is at the time there were complaints about it, okay. and so now it's, it's interesting for me to be on the other side of the issue and now see, you know, on the code side, but I absolutely respect that this isn't the time to have that conversation, so okay. I'll, I'll leave it hanging out there, and, and we'll get to it at a later time. Mm -hmm. and <clears throat> fair enough. And I, I would add that um, uh, that uh, this uh, is something that might come up in in discussions around uh, as University of Washington Bothell uh, as more students looking for housing. If we start seeing uh, houses being converted to student rentals uh, uh, on a wide scale, uh, I think that's something that we might need to address. Okay. The next item, um, this is where we're dealing with size of units, and so the proposed language that we have here is on the bottom of page three of attachment one, um, and it's incorporated into section 4E of the code, if you're trying to go back and forth. And basically what we've proposed here is separate, uh, just to give you the flexibility in the conversation, because you were at one point talking about detached versus attached. So we've pretty much used the same language for the um, attached and detached for the first sentence, um, or actually in both of them, and that is one is to limit the size to both a 40, and we've put in shading the 40%, that's up to your discretion, but a percentage of the total living space of the combined living space of the two units, and also um, a, with also a maximum square footage for the ADU. Uh, we wanted to put that same language separately for attached and detached because of the conversation, that way you could pick different figures. Um, and then we also have um, a sentence about having some discretion to the director to allow an increase in that size if, if, if appropriate because of using efficiently using the side, you know, the layout of the home. So if you have a daylight basement, if you use that provision, you sort of have some dead space that kind of gets lost in no man's <coughs> land. So, um, and then we also explicitly did add a sentence about making it clear that the size of a detached ADU is exempt from the provisions of detached structures because that's limited to 5% of the lot area? Yes. Right, so we're explicitly um, exempting a detached ADU from that limit, but they still have to follow the limits that you would put it here. So this, this staff proposal is, first of all, item three would remain 
regardless. Um, and then the, the right. choice, you're right. asking for kind of a recommendation of either one or two. Well, you could have both. If you ended up having the same percentages and square footage for both, then you could combine it just into one. Right. Um, or you can do both if you want to have different limits and, and what, detached versus attached. So let's let's discuss this. Any any um, particular thoughts <coughs> with regards to whether we need s separate language for an attached versus detached ADU with regards to size? Well, I have a I have a question first. For a detached, the the setbacks would remain the same as as to what they are right now, right? Correct. So yeah, correct. Okay. I can see where um, having a smaller, uh, having having a lower uh, maximum square footage for an at attached would make sense than you know having like 800, 800 square feet for an attached and a thousand for a detached. I think might make some sense as well. I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with that personally, as long as the setbacks are, you know, are are met. Any other comments, questions? What about the idea of the um, discretion of the director if um, any of these, um, if the ADU is all on one, one floor? Do we want to include that type of language in there or not? I, I would be in favor of that, of leaving it in there. Okay. And I'd just like to point out, I, we, we flagged that on the detached unit because since uh, accessory buildings are limited to 5% of the lot area, um, it's uh, the only situation where that would come into play would be, say, if you chose uh, 800 square feet as your maximum size for a, uh, uh, a detached unit would be on a lot close to 20,000 square feet where you could build a, a, a garage, a 1,000 square foot garage. Um, and then uh, if you wanted to use the full uh, upper floor for a, a detached ADU, that's the only area. And so if, if that's not a, an area where you think we need to uh, allow the discretion, we could leave that uh, out of the detached uh, okay. um, Thank you. requirement. How about um, on 1,000, they're kind of, right now it's as written, it's either 1,000 or 800 square feet as one of the other um, maximums. Any particular feedback on that? 800 square feet is the basic um, size of a, a size of a basic two-bedroom apartment, basically. So I think for an attached, that's a that's a reasonable um, ADU. Um, I, again, from my perspective, I think from a detached, um, I'd have no problem having it increased to a thousand square feet. Okay, so you're you're favoring detached having a larger maximum than an attached. Okay. I, I kind of want to echo, echo <clears throat> Mr. Stebman's uh, comments that um, I think the 800 square feet, I think that also falls in line with kind of the affordable housing aspect of things. If it's a little bit smaller, likely the rent might be a little bit lower too, so it'd be affordable. And I think, you know, I think that is a, a reasonable size. I would, I would think that I really don't see a reason why we would change the square footage between the two, and it might simplify the code to have it be um, the same for both so that they can be combined, but I'd, I'd be fine either way. Any other comments or feedback? Um, uh, my own thoughts are, first of all, I do agree with including both a percentage of the floor area and, and a hard number. Um, I'd be in favor of the, um, actually, I'd, I'd be in favor of the larger number, but, but uh, I understand the argument of 800 supporting a more affordable um, unit and that being part of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, so I guess I would say that from, from my standpoint, I, I, would, uh, I would go with both statements that we're going to have a separate one for attached and detached. Um, 800 square feet, and then allow the planning uh, director discretion for sentence uh, statement number two. So I think I'm reflecting the, the wishes of the commission, but I'm very open to. And any, any questions on what we're trying to provide you in the way of clarification? I, 
so oh go ahead Arthur so that means so you're going with the 40 percent in both yep and then are we doing the 800 in both or 800 in attached and a thousand in detached is or 800 I, I didn't in both? get a chance away and yeah. with this with this um, I would I, I think that we're, we're breaking quite a bit of new ground here I think that if we went with 800 with both, with the idea that if it's covering over a whole garage or it's a special exception where it makes sense, you're not going to just wall off a portion of it so you could have it above a garage. Then, you, then, then there is this tr this director's discretion. Um, this is a pretty big deal. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, for us to come this far, it's a it's a, it's pretty big. So uh, I would I would think 800 for both, but and then have that that out for the the director. Commissioner Stahl, any thoughts? Uh, I don't have anything to add beyond what's already been said. Commissioner Vliet? Yeah, so this is uh, without regard to how big the lot size is, is that correct? Correct, but that's where the setback issue comes in. You still have to meet setbacks and stuff. So just in, in the way of efficiency, let me, I think what I hear is we're all in favor of 40%. Let me, let's just take a real quick vote on uh, all in favor of, of an 800 foot limit, say aye. 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 All opposed? Well, uh, 800 square feet for the attached, yes. Uh, 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 I oppose the, the, the detached. You wanted to have right. a, a separate number right. for detached. But, and here's my concern. Mm. Um, I think if you're going to build a separate structure, it, it, it ought to have a little bit um, it ought not look out of place. It ought not look like a like a little playhouse or a little dollhouse or something. That's that's my concern from a from a detached uh, in a neighborhood as mm -hmm. opposed to an attached. Let and you think that extra two hundred square feet? Steve, let wow. me ask a question. And staff, is, what about uh, what about lot coverage? Is this exempt from lot coverage? We are proposing that uh, it would be exempt uh, detached. Uh, There's no way I'm going over a thousand there, because now we're already we're talking. These are exempt from existing lot coverage. So in a, someone that's built to the maximum size that a normal house, now they're going to now we're going to allow them to build another in their in in their setback. This is this is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, I mean you're, you're going to create a lot. I mean. Okay, they have they've met the setback, but I mean that could that's going to be a very densely it could be built fifty or R fifty four hundred. You know, you're talking most houses built today on small lots are building up to their setbacks anyway, right? Yeah. A lot, and, lot of the chip side, and that's what I'm and that's what I'm uh, saying as well. As long as they meet the setbacks, I don't I don't think the detached are really going to be an issue. I think I think the detached will be limited to larger lots of ninety six hundred square feet. Well, uh, let's, let's ask a couple 400. more questions so we don't get. What about yeah. building height? Uh, mm -hmm. The, uh, as it stands right now, the uh, height limits for accessory buildings would still be in effect, and and those are uh, 20 foot maximum or the height of the primary structure, whichever is lower. Uh, so um, now that's something that we could we could also uh, allow an exception for uh, detached accessory dwelling units, but we hadn't uh, included that in the uh, code language. So far, I, I also have a question about: um, Is there an issue, or is there a limitation as far as floor area ratio, impervious surface limitations, um, lot circle diameter, anything like that that would govern this, the attached the the, the uh, ADU unit? <clears throat> Not uh, the, the uh, impervious surface limit in single-family zones is essentially dealt with as a. Uh, limitations on uh, impervious service in the front yard so uh, which is an area that you couldn't put the a detached ADU or or uh, anyway so uh, it doesn't affect that it wouldn't affect lot circle because that's a, a platting issue um, I think we were thinking that a higher limit might be appropriate for attached so that the exception where you're doing a daylight basement sort of uh, setup would not be not be necessary in in as many cases, um, but uh, it certainly is uh, uh, possible to go the other way as well. 
So the roof score footage does not factor into the impervi impervious surface limitation on a on a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. Impervious surface is 35 percent. So they uh, so, so they still couldn't exceed that 35 percent, right, right. including the ADU. Is that correct? That's correct. So that's also mm -hmm. going to, I think, limit right. how much how dense the the property looks if yeah. you have that I, maximum because that includes the driveway, roof area. No, no, it's just buildings. Yeah, it's, the building. it's building coverage. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. So the impervious service is right. in single family is lo limited to the, the limitations on front yard. Uh, these these accessory dwelling units, if I'm not mistaken, are not subject to lot coverage, though. I thought that I thought I, that's what they're not question. subject to the five percent limit for accessory buildings, but they, they would count toward the total building coverage, right. the thirty five percent. As as we've drafted the the code language, Pat, I think that might address your concern, yeah partially address your concern. Well, about if it's if if it's if, if it's not a, the building, I thought that it was exempt from because if you had one filled up, I thought they were going to be exempt. So, okay, so so I also point out just to give you some context, a two car garage is going to be around five hundred square feet um, to give you a sense of scale. So. What you're kind of doing with 800 is making a two-story building the size of a two-car garage work as an ADU. If you're going to build above a garage, it's odd, not likely to be close to 800 square feet or more than 800 square feet. So if you're thinking of you know, what you were saying, I, I'm not sure I would characterize an 800 square foot structure detached as necessarily um, a playhouse in terms of scale. Um, and so if you think of most of the slides I showed you of detached, where were they located? Above a two-car garage. Um, so I would, you know, given the comments about big change and big jump, um, and usually there's more concern and caution about the detached units than there are the attached units in terms of neighbors, um, i just put that out there for your consideration. It's this session. So I think we're just hearing the comments. I think that we're in favor of language for both attached and detached. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first thing I'm hearing. I think the second thing I'm hearing, there's no, not a lot of debate around this 40% number. I think it's around uh, both ha uh, having um, the, the raw number between the two and whether or not that raw number is different. I think that that's what, kind of where we're at. So I'd like to, I'd like to ask uh, a yay or nay vote on whether or not we want to have, um, let's let's just word it this way, a an 800 square foot limitation on both. Let's let's start with that. All in favor of an 800 square foot limitation on both, say aye. Aye. Uh, and I would say aye. Yeah. Uh, all in favor of a different, uh, say 800 square feet on on one and a thousand square feet on another, say aye. I think that's what you were saying, Commissioner Stedman. Yes, but your point was was uh, well made. So I think I we're going to we're going to go with the 800 square feet on both. Okay. All right. Okay. Great. And the director's exception for and, both. And, yeah. and so the approval can, of the of the director's discretion. Uh, okay. So we can combine those into one. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Um, now we're on to the items that we didn't cover in the last meeting, but we've also, but we have come back to you with suggestions on how to address some of those issues. So we think some of them might be relatively straightforward because we're, in some cases, looking at continuing with the language you have now. So this is now on page four of the outline, and the first is related to um, entrances, and we are proposing something that is your current language is no more than one front entrance shall be visible from the street. We're proposing no more than one front entrance shall be on the front of the house and clearly visible from the street. Um, the accessory unit shall be on the side or rear or screen from the street to avoid the appearance of a duplex. Could that screening include uh, landscape buffers? Would that, would that be considered screening? I think it could be, yes. I'm curious what the motivation for, for for that restriction is. It's primarily to avoid the appearance of a duplex where you have two 
front entrances with uh, equal prominence uh, on the front. Uh, where, where, so basically to make it look like there's clearly a primary uh, unit and a, and a secondary. Because the ADUs are, are only going to be approved for, for single family residence zoning. Any other comments or questions with regards to that language? Are we are we are we uh, choosing between the two bullet points or the two bullet points and the uh, underlying language below? We're suggesting the underlying language, but you're cho free to choose from any of the, rec the recommended language or the bullets. <clears throat> so really, the only difference between the bullet, the second bullet, and the other point is the the uh, director's discretion. Right. Is that pretty much? Yes, we true. Just, right. So, the, so, but there is discretion in that second underlined sentence. So that's the discretion of just staff in general. That they are, they have, or what's the? Uh, I guess I have a question about what the the, the criteria is for which you'd be approved on on having a shielded entrance or something like that. Right. Well, I think with lots of code language, it doesn't say every time at the director. I mean, it's sort of staff. It's administrative driven interpretation. So here um, they would have to, whoever is doing the review would have to find a test of not being clearly visible from the street would be the direction they'd have to take in making an approval. We generally try to avoid making too many items in the code uh, uh, go to the director's mm -hmm. discretion. Uh, um, we thought that that size limit was one that uh, justified it. Yeah, I, I can just say as a kind of a philosophical manner, uh, I mean, if, if adding discretionary language for the planning director is, is really adding value necessary, okay, but as a kind of a general philosophy, I'd like to see us avoid that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so that just to provide clarity, and it also then provides more of an assurance of um, equality of uh, of treatment uh, for our, for our citizens. Not that I think our planning director is would compromise that, but just why not even let's just keep that out of the code if we can. Can I suggest a kind of a mix of the second bullet and the underlying language? Um, maybe take out the language about the planning director in the second bullet point but allow the potential for a second entrance on the front of the house, because I think the underlying language just completely disallows that on the front side of the house having a second entrance. But if but leave it up to the discretion of staff, if if it can be adequately screened on the front of the house, that that would also be allowed front side or rear as long as that criteria was met. I, That's what, that would be my suggestion. And I think that language almost is a little more clear than what we have proposed. So. I, I, don't, I think what you're trying to do there is pretty much what we were suggesting and maybe a little more clear. Okay. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Clark, just so I'm, you're, you're basically accepting bullet, bullet item number two, I guess, or it's the, the middle one there. We're taking out the planning director, but basically leaving the rest of the other language intact. I think so. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or other opinions on that? Actually, one clarification, though. They, th th this says, shall not detract from or alter the single family character of the principal unit. I think maybe the the aspect of having it be screened from the street ought to be moved into that line. It ought to come along with the elimination of the planning director so so that it's not just, so maybe that they are discouraging it being visible from the street. Because I think in the first one, it does allow for it to be Visible and whether it detracts from this alter the single family character seems to be a little arbitrary almost. Right. So, what I'm hearing is this one needs a little more wordsmithing potentially, working from the second bullet but adding in the screening concept and taking out the planning director language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. I, I was leaning towards the, the, the staff proposed language, but I think we're pretty close to that right. there anyway. So, I think. All right. Uh, and just one, yeah, what, what, one question, question on that one. Do we, um, uh, this is the engineer in me, um, is, is it obviously defined which side of the house is considered to be the front versus the side, especially in the case when it's on a corner or, or on an irregularly shaped path? Bothell, Bothell has only one front 
You guys determine what the front of the house is, don't you? Yeah. Uh, essentially, on the corner lot, the, the director has the discretion to determine which is the front. Usually, we, we uh, will um, uh, accept what the, uh, what the developer or the, the homeowner uh, wants to do, unless it's, there's an obvious reason to I could, establish I could one. I see some that maniacal be. cases where, and, and this may be going too far out on a limb, but on, on a corner lot, someone could have two two entrances on what they call the side, uh, one entrance on the front, so they would actually have three entrances in their house, which uh, may violate the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, I don't know how, how real that, 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 that becomes or not. I think that but by having the language in there of or screened from the street to avoid the appearance of a duplex, I think that that allows some flexibility right. for, th for the developer to put a door up as a corner lot. Might right. It might make sense to do that. But So we're not saying you can't put a door. We're just saying screen it, put some landscaping. You know, that's what we're really trying to, to do here. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I think we're ready to go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, the next item, we're not proposing any revision to your current language in terms of how to define de additions and in terms of their sort of design qualities that are looked for if an addition is involved with an ADO. Agreed. I, I approve that. Any any comments on that? <coughs> we're approved on that. Okay. And then under parking, we're not proposing what we don't think is essentially any difference. Um, what we're just trying to do is say one additional parking space to that which is required for the primary dwelling unit. That way you may have some zones where you don't require three or, you know, so this is just saying whatever is required for single family plus one. Now, if they already have that plus one on site, they're okay. Um, it's just they have to have one more than is required for that unit in the zone that it's within. Any comments on that? I strongly support mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, on the next one, the next one is attached versus detached. This is just, we thought, some cleanup to make it very clear in the code um, in Section 4 the, in the introduction that they're allowed in attached or detached. Um, so we just put some language in to make that clear right up front. I think we're good. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And I think this last point in this section is sort of a moot point for two reasons. One, you already have some language related to detached. And because they're both the same, you landed in the same place, it's, I think we're fine with what you have in the code to describe detached. I'm, I'm, I want to track right with you. Where are you at? I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm on page five, and it was the last bullet just before permitting, and it was related to definitions, clarity for detached. And that was only brought up because we said if you had different rules for detached versus attached, some people might really be concerned on what they were considered. So since you're using the same rule on size, and you already have a definition about detached, we think you're fine. Yep. So we think no language is needed. Agreed. Okay. Okay, so now we're on permitting and enforcement. Um, again, not discussed last time. We have, uh, we gave you several bullets, though, in the outline before about uh, the, having a formal permit process uh, or an application process for an ADU, as well as a document recorded against the property. We are recommending that the first two bullets um, be included um, as a 4-H and 4-I. Um, we think the fee does not necessarily need to be spoken to, per se, um, explicitly in the code. Um, but we do think the first two bullets are worth adding to your um, ADU provisions. Any particular feedback on that? The only thing I have is that um, we should include Snohomish County in that as well, the reference oh. to King County, or maybe just county requirements. That's that's a very good point. Thank you. And, and any other comments? My, uh, I strongly support this idea of it running with the land, and th that it would be recorded and and carried forward. Okay. Okay, um, for utility hookups, we are saying not to require separate utility hookups. And at this point, we think at least try to approach that with no explicit language per se. Um, but it might be good to hear your intent stated if you agree with that so that that would be on the record for working with staff in the future. We discussed this last time, and um, I felt that 
uh, my my feeling on this was that the separate utility hookups was kind of one of the definitions of a duplex, right. Right. kind of heading you in that direction. So I think I, I'm personally fine with that. I'm I think we're we're in agreement. Okay, so we're down to one last issue, and this was a discussion we had a little bit with you, but we didn't look at language about. Do you do anything to maybe encourage people who have them now illegally to come in mm -hmm. um, and things along those lines? And so we gave you several options um, that – and, and in the end, we are uh, suggesting some language that um, I think it is, and I guess we'll have to look at King County Department. We'll have to clean that up as well, um, that we would have – let's see, did I – I thought – Let's see. Did this, I'm thinking if we got this, I'm trying to see. I've got a little lost here. I know this is on page six, um, which we already. It's in the, uh, that's only in the code language. Right. Um, I'm actually, I don't know if we have a format, but in the chart, there is um, a provision. There was an option, um, like in the third box. Um, no, I'm sorry, I missed. I lost something here. There was a, we thought we had something that gave like a two-year. I guess it's the last box, a two-year window. Mm -hmm. um, and whether or not that's needed or not, that's a question. I mean, the we've had some cities actually kind of put language in there to say, and we're gonna you know, minimize the fee or take actions to sort of really encourage people to come in. And one way they did that was um, minimize the fee for a certain period of time from the date of enactment of the um, code update. And I must admit, I'm not quite seeing what I'm looking for at the moment. It's in the second box, I think. You're talking about the two-year. Right. In the, in the bottom box. Sir. In the bottom box. In the bottom box, right. Yeah. I see them in both. Oh, it's actually in both, I guess. It is in both, yeah. Right. right, there's a couple different. Oh, there yeah, was. The, and, the, right. and the third box, it actually waives it, um, the ADU permit fee. So um, oh, I just, I'll just make some opening comments, and then I'd like to hear um, any comments or feedback from the other commissioners. And that is that I think that um, a homeowner who has uh, done this or they purchased a home that already had one of these built, I think that they instinctively would like to have their ADU become legitimate, if you will, if at all possible. I think the reason they do is that they're thinking in their minds, at some point I'm going to sell my house. I would like to have this be recorded. I'd like to have it be advertised as a feature of this house. I'd like to be able to kind of come out of the shadows, if you will, uh, with regards to it, which uh, is fine. It, it's, it's adding value to the, to the property. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I think for uh, if we can encourage our homeowners to do that, uh, and they're going to, I believe, if they're, what they have conforms with what we've established. Now, if they have something that's 1,500 square feet, and then it's, that's not going to happen probably. But uh, I think at least for those that, have, uh, that are conforming, let's encourage them to do that. So those are my initial comments on this. Any any. Other thoughts? Well, my thought is, uh, as you said, um, I think they will add value to the to the home. Right. So there's there's an incentive right there for homeowners that have these that have not been uh, to or that have that have not been identified to uh, to have them identified to have them recorded. I think it ought to uh, I think it ought to flow with uh, with the recording of the home. But it's going to be very important that they that they meet the building codes. I mean that to me is going to be the key right there. Right. So if uh, you know if we have a reduced uh, permitting fee, um, I'd be all for that. I, I would just want to make sure that they that they that they right. met the building codes. I and and perhaps what we do is we say, okay, you've got you know from the date of enact enactment, you've got 12 months or 14 months or you know some time period mm -hmm. with that reduced fee, and after that. Well, and yeah, I mean, you raise a good point. I mean, when you say they've met the building codes, it could be that they meet the square footage 
part of it provision, but it could be that there's been wiring done that hasn't been mm-hmm. inspected. There's been plumbing done that hasn't been inspected. I mean, there could be all other things that were done by a side contractor or the homeowner themselves. And and you're saying we want to have – and let me ask that question. So if a homeowner comes forward and says, yeah, I have one of these and I want to you know, apply for a permit, are they then going to have to go back and have every – kind of system in that as it, just as if it was new construction have it be inspected um, and that could t- answer t- tell me your thoughts on that so part of it will be can they show that the space was legally built in the first place right and that is an ADU but just legally built and then they converted it and maybe they didn't do that part but the space was originally built according if not at least I went through this experience myself they will generally try to determine the year it was built. And they will say, did you build to the code when it was built? Um, but so yes, and, and in fact, if you, if you look at the last box, um, the last box is basically saying it's given a time period, and it's also saying you otherwise meet the requirements of the provisions of this section and other p- applicable code requirements. So that would trigger it's still got to be a safe unit and everything like that has to meet all code that's applicable. And what you would potentially do if you wanted to add the fee thought, which is in the box, and then go add a three there, during that time period, the ADU permit fee would be waived or whatever you want to suggest um, in here. So you could add something to that last. If you're worried about the condition of the unit and meeting otherwise, then you would I'd lean towards the last box because that's clearly stating that. But then what you could do is add another another phrase in this in that box to account for encourage you know give them a little enticement for for a period of time well i i'll just jump in first here and say that i i would if we are going to legitimize these adus we want them to be up to code right and that would and it's in the homeowner's best interest to do that i mean even if there's you know expense with regards to updating electric electrical wiring or whatever we want that to be done so i i think we do want to call that out that that would be my own thought on that um, as far as waiving uh, the permit as an incentive to have them come forward I'm probably in favor of that too um, so any thought Commissioner Vliet you know, as far as encouraging people how would homeowners that previously had one of these uh, how would they find out about this two year or would it be kind of like if they if we ever find out about it well I would imagine there would be kind of a, a lot of normal notification process that we go through to notify the public of many things, whether it's on our website, um, various newspapers. I mean, we have kind of formal processes in the city to, to make sure this notification occurs. It, am I right on that, Dave? Well, we try. Um, uh, how much uh, the general average uh, uh, citizen uh, follows our website is and, and sees those notifications is, is uh, Always a, a concern. But well, I, I would like to see us do that. I mean, whether it got into the Botha Reporter or not, I mean, I think this is a fairly significant thing we're talking about here, and I, I would like to see this be hit, hit right. pu- you know, the publicity, public mark uh, communications methods. And if I could ask a question slash make a comment, um, I just wanted to clarify that the language that we're looking at here is to waive whatever ADU fee the city charges. If somebody needs a building permit, that isn't explicitly covered unless you wanted to even go, I mean, that's not what we've typically talked about. So I just want to clarify the difference between the ADU permit, whatever fee the city comes up with, versus building any building permits that are needed. So clarification if the intent was just the ADU fee. I'm thinking just the ADU permit. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. And then the comment part is that um, you do have a new commissioner here. I'm with ARCH, which is a partnership of all the cities in East King County, and we're your housing staff, essentially. One of the issues we've identified, um, Mike Stanger's here also as well, works a lot with city on planning issues, is we're trying to get a number of the cities together in the next three, few months to actually talk about how do we increase awareness or make ADUs a more prevalent form of housing in East King County? Because a number of the members are speaking just as you are. This seems to be a really good solution. We have it. It hasn't been bad, but can we get more? So there is a general interest. And the last time we had that conversation seven or eight years ago, we actually did do some community public outreach as part of that. So um, there is another angle aside from the work you're doing here where that there might be opportunities okay. to get the word out. Thank you. 
So just for, uh, from a time check standpoint, we're at 749. So we're at about 45 minutes. Um, you're, although, although I think we've made some. Really, yeah, we've made some really no, good progress. There. You're done. Great. <laughs> no, excellent. Can I throw one more thing out there? As yeah. far as the the building inspection is concerned, I think maybe there's if we are going to kind of grandfather somebody in, I think I agree with you that we we really do need to make sure it's up to code. And I think there are certain issues that are more important than others, like life safety yeah. and emergency access, maybe energy code, that sort of thing that I want to make sure that we're not <clears throat> uh, getting ourselves into trouble by not addressing, by, by not requiring people to, to do that. I think there's... Well, that and, was, and you know, I'll, completely a that, part of my comment okay. yeah, was right. that, yeah, the, whether you're talking about liability for the city or yeah. safety right. for the citizen, uh, absolutely. And, yeah. and that's where the last box, I think, comes right out and says that. Probably pretty clearly. Yep. Okay. Not only this section, but as any other applicable code requirements. Okay. Okay. Yep. So we really we've yep. gone through the outline as yes. as you this mentioned, is, Art, and I think we have suggested changes that we have on all the red line that you see in there is reflected in the comments that we've gone through. So we have no more. If you have more, we of course address those. But we've gone through all the issues that we've identified at the staff level. Any other issues that we would want to raise? I don't think so. so the, the one thing that we haven't done is that kind of page by page review of any of the code itself, Dave. And I don't know if. And what I'm saying is essentially you have, yeah. by going through the outline, we have touch base with every change you right. see in here. Right. And, and we'll see the code in its and, final format yes. one more time. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So let, let, let me just kind of think out loud here. So, what kind of a motion do we need to kind of put in place here to, to cap this off for this evening? Well, you have two two options. You can uh, you could direct us to to uh, incorporate these changes into the code language, and um, make a motion to to recommend uh, these changes and and comp uh, and conclude this your deliberations. Or you could uh, ask us to bring those back uh, on November nineteenth, at least for for a review to make sure that we've got it right. Okay. So the chair will entertain a, a motion to either one of the points or the descriptions that Dave just described. I make a motion that we have uh, we have you bring back the recommendations that we've just discussed on November nineteenth for the final review. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate your Thanks. work. So, Dave, I think we're ready to move on to the transportation element of, uh, of the agenda. Am I right? That's right. And um, so I would, I think at this point, we're going to have um, Sherman come forward. Thank you for um, waiting through that previous segment, Sherman. Um, and uh, I had one question for you. The, the agenda said that this is the fourth review, but yet the memo said this is the third review, yeah. which is correct. This is the third. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I would just like to frame this up the way I did uh, for the first topic, and that is that we're at 7.53. If we could be wrapping this up by no later than, let's say, 8.25 to 8.30, let's try to make that happen. So at this point, the... Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, let me just give me a minute to load this up. Here we go. Okay, thank you guys uh, for a red date there. Okay, so yeah, well, this is the uh, the third third review of the first uh, or your third part of the first review, I should say, of the transportation element. Um, our previous our previous uh, 
presentations. We Just a kind of a brief review here. The first part, we talked about the background relationship to the GMA and some of the regional transportation uh, setting elements. Uh, the second the second meeting we had, we talked about some public transit and bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And uh, this being the third part is uh, we're going to focus on the goals and policies and actions of the element. In the future future meetings for the November 19th, we will, we will bring in uh, local transportation settings, more of the details of how traffic operations for existing and future conditions are. And then the uh, final part will be the financing section of the element to be brought at a future date. Uh, tonight, it's uh, myself, Sherman Gong. I'm city transportation planner. And with me is our traffic consultant, Farron Piers, and Don Samdahl. And uh, he's going to uh, help present a part of this uh, presentation for you. And I'm going to go ahead and let him start here. Good evening. I'm just going to um, give a little highlight uh, on some of the uh, possible adjustments in the state requirements, and then Sherman will walk through some specifics. Uh, you know, the State uh, Growth Management Act does require goals and policies to be part of the comprehensive plan. One of the things that's really been emphasized in this go around is um, addressing all modes of, of travel. And uh, so we're recommending a few adjustments to your policies to address that. And then the GMA also requires development regulations, uh, capital budget decisions, and other activities to be consistent with the goals and policies. So we're working on making sure that happens. Um, in your materials, uh, this is a little bit of a messy slide here, but on the next slide I, I'll show you the proposed goals. We we took a look at the eight goals that are in the current plan and recommending doing some combinations of some of the goals and cleaning up some of the language to uh, create, um, in essence, a series of six goals. And I think if you look at them in detail, you'll see that they, they really do still cover uh, all of the topics that were in the original goals, they just do it in a little bit more streamlined manner. Um, the um, I'll just hit high points on uh, each one of these, and then we can come back in some of the more detailed discussion. But the first goal, which actually um, was combining uh, goals one and eight, would merely say to move people and goods safely and efficiently. And so that's a very straightforward goal. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the second goal is identifying that there is a trade-off between mobility needs and protecting neighborhood character. And mobility, so that means we're not going to, in essence, you know, provide uh, eight-lane highways all through the city, uh, through the neighborhoods, just to make um, make it easier for people to get around in their cars. Uh, the third goal talks about um, supporting growth and vibrancy in the commercial and employment areas. Uh, the fourth goal specifically talks about reducing single occupant vehicle trips by encouraging alternative modes. Uh, the fifth goal is one that is specifically out of the Growth Management Act, and that is the need to partner with other agencies and organizations to make sure that the system works efficiently. And the last goal is to um, is around the whole subject of sustainability, and we define sustainability not just from an environmental standpoint, but also from a fiscal standpoint, that whatever you implement needs to be something that you can afford and um, can afford to maintain and operate. Before um, yeah, can, can we can go back to those. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, just make sure I'm reading this correctly. So, we currently have transportation goals. It's on page TR one, and at least in our packet, we have eight goals. And it looks like actually on the following page there was a proposed ninth goal. Yeah. But you're yeah. 
you're suggesting that we consolidate these eight or nine goals into these six. Am, am I correct with that? Yeah, the, um, so this is a, what we're going to present today is just some, some of the streamlining, like, like Don is saying about mm -hmm. the goals in general, and this is a proposal. But what you have in the packet under T page TR1 and the rest of the element mainly is edits that we feel need to be added possibly in addition to this streamline here. Okay. So the, the final goal, TRG9, on the page DTR2, is just an addition because that's something that's in addition to the existing goals we have. Okay. I guess I'm, I'm just clarifying. Are we trying to, to go to nine goals or go to six? We'd, we'd ultimately look like we're going to seven goals. Yeah, I, so it would be the, the six that you're putting on the screen plus item number nine. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I should have mentioned it. I'm sorry. So it, I, we feel that probably the easiest way to deal with this is when you talk about some of the individual policies that have been outlined. If there's agreement on those, then if there's an agreement that they should be restructured, it's easy to kind of move move things around. But rather than try and do everything at once, we're doing it in two pieces. So. Okay. Could you put those goals back up on the screen for us? So. Um, let me ask you just as a kind of an overall uh, where what was what's underlying all of these goals and that is are, are there is there some type of state like I, I it mentioned in the memo um, vision 2040 uh, trans, uh, good the state of good repair plan are, are those uh, particular uh, state um, initiatives are they Kind of reflected in these goals? Are they what's is it? Where, is that what's driving these goals? The yes, actually, those two that you mentioned are regional goals, and there's a, a number of uh, multi our uh, multi county policies that have been established, and so we're trying to be as consistent with those as possible. So the right. state of good repair one is is an example. And a lot of the specific focus on the multimodal aspects is also embodied in, in these multi-county policies. Okay. Um, I guess I'd just like to ask the commissioners for their thoughts. Um, goal number four, TRG4, reduce single occupant trips by encouraging walking, bicycling, and taking transit. Um, is that the direction that we think Bothell wants to go? And that is that we want to have as one of our goals it, that is to reduce single occupant vehicle trips. I think if we're talking about downtown Bothell and the redevelopment, certainly. I think if you're talking about some of the other neighborhood, you know, the, the, the sub areas that we're going to be talking about, that we were going to talk about last week, I think that's not a goal. I mean, you're, you're looking at developing some neighborhoods that are going to have that, 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 was, that was behind my question, and that is that there are parts of Bothell that are where there's higher de there's de high density now and it's getting higher, where this is um, a, an achievable goal, but there's many neighborhoods of Bothell that are reliant on cars and probably going to be. Therefore, um, we would want to have a, a goal in there that provides as, uh, as much uh, efficiency for the users of single oc of, of uh of vehicles, single occupant vehicles. Um, so I'm just just probing on that particular one a little bit and trying to get the feeling from the rest of the commissioners, uh, your thoughts on that. Commissioner Stahl. Yeah, I, I, I really like a lot of these. Uh, with respect to n number four, um, I, I, I think we, we can clarify what we're really after. Um, you know, for, I, I would want to replace the phrase reduce single occupant vehicles with what we're really trying to do is it is it to reduce congestion? Is it something about reducing carbon emissions? Is it to reduce fuel consumption? I mean, there, there's some underlying motivating goal, mm -hmm. and, and, I'd like and I think that's that. significant because exactly. depending on the real goal, it, it actually pulls you in different directions. If if the real goal is about reducing congestion, then there are plenty of, for example, rural neighborhoods where single occupancy vehicle is just fine. It's, congestion is not a problem. And, and mm -hmm. trying to do a transit solution there is actually counterproductive. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's not enough of a population center to do that sort of thing. So depending on just what the real goal is behind that, you know, let's, I, I'd like to see that a little, a little more explicit. 
Elsewise, we may end up encouraging mm -hmm. counterproductive behavior. I would really agree with that. Any other comments? I, I, Mr. Clark. So would it be, this is kind of saying the same thing in a different way, but you could instead of focusing on reducing single occupancy vehicle trips, you could either, you could, you could say promote high occupancy vehicles trips where appropriate or reduce where appropriate. Because I do agree with you. I think trying to put a transit system in a rural area is not economically feasible, and so you wouldn't want to have code or have the, the plan directing you in that direction. But can we make it <clears throat> more about promoting where promoting HOV where? Where appropriate. Well, and, and, and I think even to, to Commissioner Stahl's point that it's really um, promoting, e let's say, a reduction in congestion or an increase in efficiency or some, or perhaps there is some type of uh, sustainability or yeah, environmental goal. I, I think goal. G6 captures, ca captures the environmental aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would be fine changing G4 to reduce congestion by encouraging walking, bicycling, and taking transit. Where, where appropriate. Yeah, I mean, that's that my point being that Bothell has high-density areas. We have still some that are quasi-rural, and the single-occupant vehicle is going to be there and be there for the foreseeable future. We can certainly work with that. I think that's a good comment that it's more focused in terms of what the we're trying to achieve rather than the way it's worded right now. Okay, so how about at this point, I think you've kind of gotten the direction that we, we'd like to have you kind of rework goal four. Okay. And, um, but other than that, I, I like the consolidation. Uh, I actually felt as I read through the uh, goals one through eight that there was a lot of kind of rep uh, repetition or I thought, so I think we're, we're getting somewhere and, and um, I do think taking some time and energy on these goals is really important because I do think our, our policies and our actions fall out of these goals. And so um, uh, overall, though, I think, uh, I think that uh, it's a really uh, a positive step that you have up there, those six goals. But if you could just work, uh, rework G4, that'd be great. So the other area that I wanted to touch on is about level of service policy and the city currently has a, a good level of service policy for congestion vehicular movement and again consistent with what the PSRC is requiring is to um, provide more specific guidance on service levels for other modes and so um, the city isn't quite right um, to necessarily set a specific level for um, non-motorized, but for in the case of transit, in fact, this is very similar to a policy that's already in the plan, is to um, focus on setting a, a service level for transit that meets um, the community's ex expectations and it can be used as a way to um, negotiate with transit agencies. Obviously, the city doesn't have control over um, the frequency or provision of a bus service so um, but this uh, service levels similar to what we have shown here are, are what we'd be proposing and we'd be coming back to you with some specifics if you like the general direction with that we're heading on this um, just a, a housekeeping question um, several times in in the memo and the supporting documentation um, Figure TR10 and TR9 is is referenced. I don't see that on the slide, but I, it was in our packet. And I didn't see a TR9 or a TR10. And so then I went back and looked at the other uh, times in our agenda of where the transportation element was incorporated. It, and I couldn't find it. So I don't know if, it, if you found it as well. I, I think, so help me out with TR9 and TR10. Are you TR10. talking about figures? Yeah. Okay. Figure, yeah, figure TR9 to figure TR10. Okay, so those figures are basically just a, have a description of where our existing bicycle and, and non, and pedestrian facilities are. And uh, at this point, it's, it's, uh, it's just referencing where, where future network, future network connections are for pedestrian and bicycle facilities. Great. I, so I'd love to see that at some, 
Absolutely. We're, we're updating those in, in the process, and so it was uh, just as a reference, it, assuming that we have a, we all have access to, to, the, to the, pre, the previous, um, the previous, the existing, the existing transportation plan, I should say. And so you will, you'll be, be incorporating that into the plan. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. This Thank is you. Just, just the language at this point. We're just we're just trying to uh, incorporate the language and, and and put that in there right now. Okay. I should have yeah. included that yeah. those figures in. So maybe on the, in, the, in the next maybe on November nineteenth. That could be included. Mm -hmm. yeah, Great. That, they will all be included. At Great. That point. Thank you. So let me just say one thing. You'll see this in this slide as well as for the. Um, Bicycle and pedestrian levels of service. We're proposing a simplified service level. Uh, you, you might be aware for the roadways that we use the letter grades A through F, which works reasonably well for um, traffic, but not so well for other modes. So we're looking at just a very simple uh, green, yellow, red. And the city would then designate, well, we would like a particular a yellow standard in some areas or a green standard in, say, the downtown area. And so it's something we found that is pretty easy, easily understood by the public. Yeah, I mean, that's and that's typical kind of methods for a dashboard and used mm -hmm. in all kinds of measure, measurements. So uh, I think we're very much in support of that. So the... Um, the other one, the under bicycle level of service, um, the city's proposing to do a more in-depth non-motorized plan subsequent to this comprehensive plan update. And so whatever comes out of there in terms of a minimum treatment for bicycles, um, be it uh, a bike lane or a, a, a set of sharrows, whatever that is would be set at this green level and you can see that um, there would be a, a lower level defined in the yellow so I, at this point uh, until that plan is completed it's hard to set the the specific okay number here and the same thing is true for the um, pedestrian facilities and I will say um, that it doesn't show it here this is for sidewalk requirements but we would also be recommending to have something comparable for um, pedestrian crossing treatments, which is also a very important safety feature for um, for pedestrian movement throughout the city. Excellent. So, okay. Um, so you're back up, Sherman. Thank you. Okay, so those goals and policies, those. Uh, the pedestrian transit; those are uh, again just to be incorporated. And again, we want to just introduce those are not currently in our our policies and actions, right? So we're all clear on that. These uh, the next sections here are the next few slides. I'm just going over some of the uh, actual changes that we did make edits to within the element um, street and highway policies and actions. Um, we could go through individually, but they're to summarize them. They're basically including to continue including regional coordination policies and actions uh, with cooperation with adjacent uh, jurisdictions and and other cities on uh, the key corridors that we have. Uh, reducing signage requirements for truck traffic in residential areas. There's a there's a policy to uh, to put exist to put. Uh, truck restriction signs everywhere, and it just uh, unnecessary. I don't at this. I don't believe it's necessary to do that. We don't really have any major, you know, problems with truck traffic in our residential areas, and I think it's just not a. It's just one of the policies that we wanted to remove because we don't have that problem, and it would be not a good use of uh, putting signage up just for clutter. Um, Maintaining a pavement management system, which we, we do in a ways now, and we just want to uh, continue that in the state of good repair program where we are looking at uh, having a system that does identify and, and um, continue to, to monitor our uh, 
current infrastructure, which is the direction of, which is the direction of the PSRC goals. <coughs> For the neighborhood, uh, just, oh. just a quick question: When you say monitor, uh, what what does that mean? Basically, just having a system where we would develop how to how to continue looking at our existing pavement or any. Uh, the, well, the direction is the, of the of the PSRC that uh, is to to invest in your existing facilities, as opposed to having to just continue looking at creating new facilities. And there's a better turn uh, return on your. That's the direction. That's the information that you get. Is that you get a better return on just investing on your existing facilities. And when we say monitor, that could mean you know until we develop an ex exact program, it could mean just uh, keeping an inventory of what we have for our bike network, what, we, what do we have for our pedestrian network, and and maintaining, uh, having a better schedule for maintenance, for example, and, and just following that system that we put in place, ultimately we developed, and, and just monitoring that. That's what I mean by monitoring. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, th thanks. I, I, I wasn't sure when you first said it if that alluded to some new technology or sensors or something like that, but th no, thanks for clarifying. Right. That could mean that later, you know, if we have that resource. One of the things I, I, I would like to see you do, and I think it's actually in the packet, it's done more clearly maybe than what you're doing here, Sherman, and that is, uh -huh. um, first of all, clear, distinguish between a policy and an action. And then the policies, let's be sure and line them up with the particular goals, which whatever our six or seven goals are. And um, now I'm looking at these eight goals that we had, just as an example. So the first bullet point there, include regional coordination policies and actions. That policy supports uh, goal number seven. Now this, this is not from your slide, but actually from our packet. Yes. Um, plan and develop a transportation through intergovernmental coordination consistent with the context of Bothell's regional and local comprehensive planning goals. So I, I just let's make sure that we're kind of connecting the dots here between our goals and our policies and our actions. Okay, I understand. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there is a going through these updates, it's it's a little bit difficult to understand what's the difference between an action and a policy. It is actually somewhat repetitive and redundant, if you will, Understood. even. Yep. Um, okay, so moving on. The uh, neighborhood protection policies and actions. Um, continue to, uh, one of the changes there is to continue maintain, to maintain the neighborhood traffic calming program as opposed to initiate one because we have established that and we have one adopted for the city. Um, continue to discourage cut through traffic, but accommodate the arterial accessibility. That's, uh, that has to do with the uh, policy that right now where you, for new development, we don't want any through, uh, basically, you know, through streets, which makes it somewhat awkward when you're in some developments to, you know, not have that and it's uh, how do we continue to maintain that or do it in a more uh, effective way that does recognize that we need arterial accessibility from this subdivision but at the same time trying to design it in a way or to prove it in a way where you're not encouraging you know just movement from outside the neighborhood through another through, an, through a new neighborhood right um, uh, pursue the public outreach and education as a means of traffic calming. That's uh, to be added there. Just uh, it's the it's the first method of of in, when we instigate traffic calming measures. That is the first the first goal we do is to educate a neighborhood or existing community. Uh, remove monitoring of traffic levels in residential streets. That's uh, again an action in there that we felt that need to we're just not going we don't have the resource to continue to just go and do traffic counts everywhere to continue to see if there's a, a, a traffic calming issue we respond to traffic calming when it is a brought to our attention as staff 
and we will go and do traffic counts to uh, substantiate if there's an issue or not and that's that's just part of what we do as a part of the traffic calming program that's been adopted now so to say that we will monitor traffic levels in residential streets is again it's just uh, it's like putting the signs up for truck tra you know to discourage truck traffic everywhere it's so are, are we're not going are there do neighborhoods that. in Bothell I'm not aware of where we're just on a permanent uh, kind of basis monitoring traffic levels we, we don't okay so why are we talking about removing them because there's a well the the policy let me see I can go find it exactly it says TRA 23 right TRA 23 in the, exist the action actually yeah. it says it says that we will <clears throat> as an action regularly monitor traffic levels through residential neighborhoods in order to identify and implement traffic calming measures as early as possible okay so, so what you're saying is is that we're not going to just do this proactively but we're, we're going to do it more reactively we will do it but it's more if there's a complaint or we're aware of a particular problem we're, it's not like we're not going to monitor but it's not going to be done in this kind of and we'll monitor it as the demand need yeah as the understood demand reaches. that's okay. just otherwise. I remember it, it, it one of the previous um, meetings where, it, where the transportation element came up that we I think we discussed this actually quite extensively and we talked about the nature of Bothell and that it it's kind of runs north and south and the and the kind of the, the the heavy traffic corridors tend to kind of run that way we've got 405 going through the map but it's more those east-west that east-west access where uh, we do have some neighborhoods that have an issue with with that and so I'd like to see us continue to to see what we can do to mitigate so I don't want us to to get out of the traffic calming or neighborhood calming business but I think you're just saying we're going to do this in a reactive a, a way that res it's a responsive way let's just put it that way rather than just right. monitoring well that's what our that's the whole purpose of when we adopted the neighborhood traffic calming program we now have a method there's a process that we follow uh, you have to reach a certain criteria for us to you know go examine if there's an issue of traffic calming for example and uh, you know, part of that is, you're right, that the, the, our the traffic flow in the city east-west is very challenged. There's very limited corridors that go east-west. So, you know, the, the traffic that do look for different ways to go east-west do sometimes cut through neighborhoods. Right. And we want to discourage that if it's not along a corridor that we really haven't uh, expected traffic to do that on. And so, so we we may uh, I, I I understand the point of striking the action about regularly monitoring traffic sure. levels, but are we investigating new technologies with regards to traffic calming monitoring, if you will? I'm thinking of perhaps um, fo photographic um, sensors. We've I've actually gotten one of those tickets myself. Uh, where, you, know, we, you, you know, the camera takes the picture, <laughs> or or I've seen them where you have the the radar and it just flashes up that here's what your speed is, and just just to kind of sometimes just to inform people. Are we investigating those kinds of technologies to we, help in traffic calming? Absolutely, we have, and we've installed you know uh, speed radar detectors, but we we're not we've not had the uh, we don't have this, you know, direction to go ahead with any photo enforcement type of, you know, mechanism technology to to do that at this time. Uh, I think that uh, by by just looking at where we are having the problems and and addressing those any traffic calming issues in the neighbor in the in the city wide, uh, it's just a matter of at this point just dedicating resources to it and continuing to to. To use this program that's already been adopted and in place. All right, thank you. Uh, so again, that's the last bullet there. Continue to respond to those neighborhood traffic concerns as, and and keep and keep that you know keep a budget for that for us to address those things. <clears throat> uh, the public transit and transportation demand management, transportation system management policies and actions continue to coordinate with the transit agencies uh, where they are looking at adding uh, parking rides or bus stops any related amenities 
Um, SWIFT 2, for example, is a community transit plan to extend that service off uh, down, down SR 527 to Canyon Park Business Park right now. And they plan to do that in the next four years, and we want to be, you know, supportive of that because that would help the congestion issues we have. Uh, pursue joint funding for future facilities with with those agencies. Uh, explore options to implement the Bothell uh, Circulator. Again, that's uh, that was for the economic development, and we, we talked about that. You you guys are aware of that. Um, Remove the development codes for the design of transit access. Again, that is uh, that is just one of the the one of the we the policies that we have in place that I felt you know we don't have a control over because we don't we don't develop those codes for or those standards for the tra transit agencies. They they do that, and it just it was one of the the policies that we felt just probably should just be removed being that we're trying to you know streamline this whole program you know streamline and cut back on the whole plan itself as a goal in general uh, continue promoting transit use by uh, developing those stops and encouraging the transportation demand strategies it's uh, that's pretty standard stuff there The bicycle policies and actions uh, continue to pursue funding, complete the missing links of the North Creek Trail, uh, promote additional bike connections to regional trails and activity centers, and identify the service levels as Don alluded to in our proposed uh, bicycle and pedestrian and transit uh, sections. Uh, Update the Civic Share TIP to include key bicycle corridors, and to uh, develop a citywide bicycle plan that identifies and supports the programs and projects to encourage development of safe bicycle access to the network. And that is uh, that is primarily to address the active transportation plan goal of the PSA regional, the regional goals that uh, that we described earlier. For the pedestrian policies, enhance connections to trails and, uh, again, activity centers, education centers. <clears throat> uh, prioritize the connectivity projects based on demand and safety. Again, addressing the service levels that we have there to get, you know, from that red light to the green light, if you want. Uh, pursue uh, funding opportunities with the school district and adjacent jurisdictions when they're when they come up uh, and we remove some city policies already covered under the under the federally mandated ADA requirements some of these some of the policies and actions that we have in here were uh, discuss discuss those issues which you know we already have to do now so it's some seem repetitive to put it in here and uh, again just to Bring down this, cut down this man, cut down this whole plan, and and get it more concise where we need it, as opposed to having having uh, these types of uh, policies which are already required by federal law, anyways, and that we will have to do in terms of any projects we we design, we you know, those are just required. So, um, and then the final bullet is just to uh, again develop a citywide pedestrian plan a more thorough one than we have right now i.e. the the two figures that we referred to earlier TR9 and 10 we're going to expand on that and and actually you know look at a more comprehensive plan that shows maybe prioritization identifying which corridors are most important to get that connectivity and and we're just going to we're going to we're going to do a, a concerted effort to to define what those those projects may be, and and how we can, how we can systematically improve improve both bicycle and pedestrian networks in the future. Okay, so that kind of covers the changes in general for 
the policies and actions goals section. I uh, just wanted to uh, give you a little forecast here on what we will bring next time uh, and where we are right now and, and since we haven't seen you since you know June. <laughs> um, the uh, transportation element update tasks in progress. We have uh, completed the, the travel demand model. Uh, Fair and Peers has been working with that us on that. We've calibrated the future scenario analysis and um, we've conducted the level of service analysis also for the existing current year and the future year 2035. Uh, those base conditions. Again, we are in the process of looking at sub area analysis and that may change, you know, we may have to manipulate the uh, and adjust the, the model to account for those kind of changes. But at this point, the, the results have shown that the existing conditions for all of our, our traffic corridors that we use for concurrency analysis operate at level of service D or better. Um, under the 2035 base condition where our baseland use assumptions and everything have been in, incorporated. We achieved a level of service E, but with some of obviously some future uh, future improvement projects that were targeted for some of the concurrency intersections. Um, those those projects have been identified, um, and we are finalizing the the final recommendations that will go in to the element itself, and we are also developing the cost estimates. Um, and finalizing those for those specific projects. And, um, and we're updating a few of the statistical data that you see in the local transportation setting section, uh, mainly just uh, some of the collision history, like I say there, uh, finalizing possible roadway classification changes. Not very many at this point that we've seen where we would want to, you know, convert a local street to a collector or anything like that, you know. Uh, uh, just finalizing some of the pedestrian bicycle routes and the data in, in involved with those, some of the other, and some of the other elements you see there. That's what we'll be bringing to our November 19th meeting and that will, this will all tie that together. And, uh, and one of our next biggest steps, which I wanted to just put on this final slide, is is the uh, the last section that we will come back with. Ultimately, is to identify the the transportation funding program, and um, it will determine determine the future transportation expenditures and what funding sources we have from local funds, state, federal, and uh, Conduct the analysis to make sure that we have a, a balanced, a balanced approach on that. So I think at this point we uh, have any public testimony, which we don't, I'm sure. And uh, if you have any other questions for me, otherwise we will continue the element update on November 19th with the local transportation setting section. That will give you a little more. Uh, details about that part of the element, uh, some of which was included in your packet, the level of service corridors. You saw that. That was, uh, that showed the, uh, where we are and where the, where really the purpose of giving you that section was to show you the, the hot intersections that we really need to target and look at in terms of, uh, future improvements. Um, that will also help you guide you in looking at where we load up any sub area changes and you know where we're going to have uh, some traffic you know uh, some of the traffic con con you know congestion that where the biggest tie ups are okay thanks Jeremy. um okay. time check where we ran over a little bit but uh, we're not far off let me just ask uh, the commissioner any questions or comments for uh, can I make a comment Sherman before you go yeah um, we we all spend a lot of time reviewing what is presented before we even come to the meeting. Yes. And what we have in our packet is not what was presented. Can you please make sure next time you come before us that we have in front of us what it is that you're going to review? Uh, make sure, if you would, make sure that we have tables that are legible. We've got a table in here that I can't read. 
make sure that the missing pages, the TR9, TR10 is in there, etc. I have a lot of questions and comments on, on what was in this package that I, I don't even know if they're if they pertain to what to what you just presented, so I've got to I've got to go back and and uh, go through this stuff now and then shoot emails to everybody. I guess I just I'm I'm a little frustrated. I'm a little frustrated because again we you know we spend time digesting this in order to to have a, an intelligent conversation and dialogue. So was okay. there uh, just to. Help me, you know, prepare well, sure. better you've for got, next time. You've got you've got six goals that you're showing here. You've got nine goals in here. You, uh, in in the package, you've got um, you've got 22 or 23. You got 28. I'm sorry, you got 31 action plans. And up here, I think I saw nine or ten. You've got uh, I, I, it, what what we have is not what we were presented with. Any other questions or okay. comments? I, I would agree with that. I, it, it was a little, it's a little confusing to me too. And it, part of it's probably just the subject matter is complicated too. But I think if it were, maybe there should be some effort put into organization. The, the, the document that we were provided is, mm -hmm. it's fairly clear in terms of goals, policies, actions. Uh, there's a lot of different sections on regional coordination, streets and highways, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I went through it. Pretty closely, I, I, and yet I'm not. I don't think I'm ready to, to 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 vote on this language or whether we would recommend it going forward or not. But I do think that that was behind my point about linking up policies with goals, linking up actions with policies, mm -hmm. so that I think that's how we it, we really try to read this material. So that and then if we're going to modify an action or a policy, then we kind of understand what it is we're being asked to do. So that would be my recommendation for November 19th, Sherman, would be to um, kind of a little more rigidly link, link um, what we have in front of us and what we were provided in our packet and what you develop on the screen for us. I think it would, it would help you get the outcome from us that you're, you're looking for. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, so um, at this point, I think we're we're ready to have take a motion to continue the public hearing of the 2015 periodic plan and code update. Um, the transportation element will be uh, and actually. Uh, I think we have concluded actually, Dave, haven't we? The uh, amendments regarding accessory. So that really was was the ADU part of it. That was part of the public hearing of the 2015. Anyway, yeah. have we can, we haven't concluded that, have we? Have well, we? you asked us to bring back uh, final That's code right. language on the 19th, right? Uh, so, November 19th. Okay. so I'd like to hear a motion to reflect um, that we will continue the public hearing. Move to continue the public hearing for the transportation element to November 19th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And and then just we should also continue the public hearing on the periodic plan and code update to October fifteenth, uh, one week from tonight, when Correct. we'll pick up. Uh, Correct. So uh, let's let's have another motion to just continue the public hearing for the periodic plan twenty fifteen periodic plan and code update to October fifteenth. Yeah, I move that we continue the public hearing on the two thousand fifteenth periodic plan and code update to October fifteenth. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. Uh, moving forward with our agenda, uh, we have no study session this evening, no old business. Um, we do have a report from staff, the hearing examiner third quarter report. We do have that in our packet, Dave. I know I reviewed it. I believe the other commissioners have. Is there anything you'd highlight for us on that? There, there's not a whole lot there, but so that's pretty self-explanatory. I do ha have one other thing uh, that I do want to touch on schedule-wise. So next week we'll take, o take up the items that were uh, originally scheduled for the first, uh, plus we're going to try to do two other sub-area plans. Uh, it's, it, it's a lot uh, to cover, but uh, these sub-area plans are, are uh, we think are fairly straightforward, so we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to get through those. Um, and then 
uh, some two of those subarea plans are scheduled to come back the following week, along with a, a third review of the land use element, um, uh, which is also scheduled for uh, for for the fifteenth. Uh, I wanted to ask Commission if, um, since a one-week turnaround uh, time is is difficult to do, uh, um, if uh, the Commission would uh, be up, uh, would consider uh, moving the 22nd uh, meeting to the 29th. We don't normally meet on a fifth uh, Wednesday when we have it, but uh, uh, that would uh, facilitate uh, um, making that turnaround uh, work. Um, so, any feedback on moving from the 22nd to the 29th? Uh, I will not be in town that day, but that doesn't mean that. Um, Commissioner Stahl could not lead the meeting. No, but I'll be here. Yep. So no, any no problem. Other? I'm in front of you. for me. Everybody else, October 29th. As well. Yep. Okay. Okay. So we'll make that that change. Great. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. We are adjourned.